Hello everyone, welcome to this week's EKG. Uh, here's a quick look at the one we're gonna be talking about today. I'll give you a second to examine it and see what you think and then we'll go through it together. Uh, what I like about this one is there's a little bit of uh, patient involvement here with the artifact, so that happens a lot and uh, we have to interpret through it, so we'll work through that together. All right, your story for your patient is that we have a 36-year-old male. He's not feeling well. He does have a history of end-stage renal disease, and he missed his last dialysis appointment just because he was feeling too sick to go. When you get your set of vital signs, here's what you see. You have a heart rate of 80, a blood pressure of 188 over 95, so a little hypertensive, which is not uncommon in our dialysis patients. Um, he's 99 on room air. He's not complaining of shortness of breath, normal respiratory rate, normal blood sugar, a little bit febrile. Um, and so um, that's what we have. And of course, since he is an in-stage renal disease, um, think about all the things you need to think about with that. Um, and then we get our 12 lead. So remember that a lot of times our renal failure patients won't have typical ACS symptoms. So it's always important to get a 12 lead on them. And one of the particular things you're looking for is hyper K. Uh, we read this one just like we always do, same way every time so that we don't miss anything. Starting with our rate, the computer says we have a rate of 82. I'm just going to confirm that uh, with our eyes here. So let's find a QRS that matches up with one of the thick red lines and then we'll count down. And so it looks like this one is pretty good to me. That's the first one that caught my eye. So we'll start here. 300, 150, 175. So somewhere between 75 and 100 to the next QRS complex. Um, 82 fits right in with that. I'll agree with the computer here. So we'll say he has a rate of 82, which is normal and reassuring. Our second thing we look at is the rhythm. So the two questions we ask here, is there a P wave before every QRS, meaning that it's the signal to, for the heart to beat is coming from above the ventricles and the sinoatrial node. That's what that P wave signals. Um, sometimes our best place to see a P wave is lead two. Is there a P wave before every QRS? And again, we're having to work through a little bit of this artifact here, but I think that I do see P waves all across the 12 lead here. So we would call this sinus rhythm. Next question, is it regular or irregular? And you know, if there's really a question, you can bust out your calipers or flip up your paper and march them out. Today, I don't think we need to do that. So the regular, just um, global look at this 12 lead, it looks like it is regular. So I would call this a regular sinus rhythm. And then moving on to our axis, if you remember, we always look here at lead one and lead AVF. And this is the way that the majority of the depolarization is going in the heart. So lead one, recall that you're using your left thumb to go with the majority of the QRS vector. And so in lead one, the majority of the QRS vector is up here. So we have thumbs up in lead one. AVF, again, looking at the majority of the QRS vector, AVF is up. We have two thumbs up. This is a normal axis for us, which is also very reassuring. Moving on to our intervals, we look at our QRS interval. We want that to be less than 120. We're at 78 here for milliseconds. That's good. Nice narrow QRS complex, which also matches with what we're seeing. And then we look at our QTC. And 450, anything greater than 450 is considered prolonged. 500 is where we really start to get concerned that they could be at risk for a spontaneous dysrhythmia. So technically this is a prolonged QT. Do we need to do anything about this aggressively right now? I don't think so, but it's something to take note of as you're thinking about what your treatments might be um, based on the pr patient presentation. So our intervals generally look okay. And then we move on to where everyone wants to skip to first, our ST segments. And I like to read these in territorial distributions, so I uh, try not to miss anything. I tend to start on the left side with the inferior leads. So we look at two, three, and AVF. This is where we start to get into a little bit of that artifact. It's a little bit more challenging here, but you're looking for any ST segment elevation or depression. Um, off of the baseline. And you just try to find a QRS with a T complex that is in line with itself to look for depressions or T wave inversions there. And I'm not seeing any in the inferior leads. Then I typically move to my high lateral leads. Uh, that would be one and AVL. 
here again like nice solid baseline here with no T wave inversions or elevations or depressions. This one is one with the most artifacts so it's kind of hard to tell but in general I would say that's a nice flat line here. One thing does catch my eye and it's inverted T wave in AVL. Whenever you see that that's not normal and what that can be an early indicator of is inferior ischemia. So what in my mind what that means is when I see this, it may have been there before, but we just don't know in the pre-hospital setting, right? And so if you have time to get another 12 lead, um, based on this signal here, I would get another one if you have time and are able, just to make sure there's no evolving changes in the inferior leads, okay? Um, but right now, not much to do about that. I don't see any other changes that are concerning, so we'll move on to our septal and anterior leads for our ST segments. And again, like pretty close to the baseline here, maybe like one box of elevation here in V3, you're allowed to have that. So in V2 and V3, to count for a STEMI equivalent, you need to have two boxes of elevation with reciprocal changes. So we know there's no reciprocal changes. One millimeter, one small box of elevation here is acceptable. Uh, we don't see any in the other leads and no inverted T waves or anything that looks concerning. But something does stick out here, and it's this very large, very spiky T wave, and it goes all the way across the precordium. Um, it comes right up to a really high point, lots of energy there. Uh, I had a, a mentor one time tell me that the T wave is made of potassium, and so you see big, strong T waves here. You've got to be thinking about potassium in your renal failure patient. And so we see no ST elevations that are concerning, but we do see peak T waves in the anterior leads. So at the end of the day, this is a very concerning for hyperkalemia, very concerning EKG for hyperkalemia. We have a normal sinus rhythm with a regular beat and no signs of ischemia, but we do have peak T waves, very consistent with hyperkalemia. The patients you need to think about this in all the time are your renal failure patients by far, number one. Um, if you have a patient that's on dialysis, you need to worry about hyper-K. Those kidneys aren't working, and that's your main filter for potassium. And if they miss dialysis, they are at risk for having too much potassium in their blood. Another patient population you need to think about this in is your patients with crush injury or soft tissue injury that has been there for a while. So patients that uh, maybe you're going to an extrication for some machinery or something like that and they've been in there for a little while enough to burst a lot of cells because potassium lives inside the cell. And if those cells burst, when they burst, they release all that potassium into the bloodstream. The safe place for potassium in the body is inside the cell. You usually have sodium outside in the blood and potassium inside in the cell. And when those cells burst, all that potassium comes out and can cause a lot of problems for the heart. It can be deadly. Um, so any patient that's had a significant crush injury, significant burn injury, any kind of tissue where a bunch of cells are destroyed, you need to think about hyper-K. And then another one is acidosis. And these would be your bad sepsis patients that have been sick for a little while or laying in bed. They have a very low end title. They have some kind of metabolic problem going on or medical problem. The reason hyper-K happens in these patients is because the acid-base balance is off. And when your acid-base balance is off, your cell membranes get weak and can burst. And when those cell membranes burst due to too much acid in the blood, the potassium comes out and then you have hyper-K. So your three patient populations, renal failure, crush injury, and then cellular injury due to acidosis, that's where you need to think about hyper-K. And what we see happening here, why this happens, is because the heart uses the exchange of sodium and potassium to reset the heart to beat again. It's all just like a battery. The movement of ions creates electricity basically to make the muscle work. And so in moderate hyperkalemia, where it's not too bad, but it's getting there, what you're going to see is that the cell is partially depolarized. So a nice normal beat, the sodium and potassium exchange, you have a nice normal T wave. Um, T wave is made of potassium. But as you get a little bit too much potassium in that blood, all of these positively charged um, potassium ions are building up kind of like I think about it like the the gate at a uh, stadium where everybody's rushing to get in and get the good seats right everybody's piling up right at the door ready to rush in because they want to get inside and that's where they're supposed to be potassium is just like that all of these positively charged ions are building up outside in the blood they know they need to get into the cell the cell needs them to be in there to help with depolarization and so 
the minute that gate opens, they rush in. So they have an increased resting potential and that cell is very excitable and they all rush in and that makes the really big, really peak T wave. That's what you're seeing on this 12 lead is all that potassium is rushing in and crea creating a nice strong repolarization. Now as we get more severe, we'll talk about later, the cell is basically just broken. There's way too much potassium. It's overwhelming and the cell doesn't work. And so uh, we'll talk about that on one of our following episodes with severe hyperkalemia. But for this patient, this is one where I would give albuterol. Albuterol is your best option to move potassium into the cell very quickly. It's non-invasive, you don't need an IV. It moves the potassium where you want it to be and it's very safe for your patient. So in this moderate with peak T waves, what you wanna do is keep that heart from getting unstable. Move that potassium into the cell um, and give it, give it through the nebulizer. You can give up to 15 milligrams. Now, if you notice that your patient starts to get unstable and the first indicator of instability is a decreased heart rate, and also a wide QRS. So remember, you wanna keep a close eye on your Q, QRS interval. If it starts to get greater than 120, that's where you're gonna give your calcium. Calcium will narrow the QRS and help stabilize that membrane while you're moving potassium back into the cell with your albuterol, okay? So you hold off on your calcium till you have a wide QRS, and both of these treatments will be very effective for hyper-K. That is all we have for today. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next week.